All right, we're going to talk about logic apps, workflows, and automations, and how those can make you more productive. My name is Carl Henrik Nilsson. I work as a technical evangelist for Microsoft. But I started after we, be we became less evil. Uh, so logic apps is commonly referred to to by as integration first, configuration first integration services. It is primarily being referenced that way by tossers, because nobody understands what it means. Has anyone used Sapia? If this, then that? Something like that? Hands up. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to throw things at you. Very nice, about half of you. So Logic Apps is kind of like Sapier, but on steroids. It's a visual workflow engine that we can use to make lots of nice integrations. If you would have talked to me three years ago, I would have told you I hate that. Because it makes no sense to me. I want to write code. I want to do things the old way. But on the other hand, if you would talk to me 10 years ago, I didn't want to use object relational mappers or entity framework or anything like that. And today I do that. And today I use logic apps because, you know, not all sizes fits everyone. There is no one size fits all, right? And I just had to update my slide today because I found this tweet that kind of sums up exactly how I feel about this subject. Abby Fuller wrote, I'm sorry to be the one to tell you this, but there are no magical nerd bonus points for doing things the hard way. And I feel sorry because I had a lot of nerd bonus points. But I felt like, okay, yeah, this makes sense, right? We can, we can skip the, the annoying and hard inter interactions that we don't want to do. And we can just focus on what makes us more productive. Because in, at the end of the day, what we want to be as software professionals, no matter if we're in quality assurance, if we're in development, if we're product management, or if we're even management, we want to be more productive. And then I found this person who had replied to that, which just sums that up perfectly. The developers are over there. <laughs> All right, so what can we actually do? So with Logic Apps, let's say we want to do something pretty simple. We want to take SQL Server, and, and we want to start a conference. Let's call it Build Things. Every time somebody buys a ticket at Build Things, we want to add, we have a website that adds a row to a database. Every time a row is added to this database, we want something to pick up on that event and send an email to this attendee and say, hi, thank you for attending build things. And how hard can that be? How many, any programmers that want to take a, an estimate for me? How many hours would you say? Six weeks. He, and it, that's a senior developer. <laughs> or possibly a consultant. So with Logic Apps, this is about five minutes. And it's very, very inexpensive. It's part of the serverless configuration systems. And I'm going to show you today how we can build these sort of workflows. But also, I'm going to focus on how we can use these sort of workflows for also personal productivity that you can implement today. Sounds good? Cool. So how would this look from like an, an application perspective? If you would open up the Azure portal and go to Logic Apps and create a new Logic App, you would see something like this. You would do a SQL Server connector that says, when an item is created, send an email from a shared mailbox. Or if you want to do it from your own mailbox, that's fine too. All the code for this is pre-written, so it's basically like legal Lego bricks. You just take whatever you want, and you put them in. If you expand these, you find that there is a lot of available options presented to you for each different sort of connector, such as who do you want to mail it to, from whom, what does the subject be, what should the body text be. And for most of these connectors, there are advanced topics where we can go in and do like attachments and HTML settings and how important it would be. So most things that you normally can do that if you've written the code, would be a pain to add when some manager came and asked you for it, because it wasn't in the specifications when you started, right? And there's a ton of different of these sort of connectors, as I'm saying, 
these integration endpoints. There's actually over 280 available services today. You want to do a test? You're in the front row. Name a service that you like and use. Gmail, got that. You there, name a service that you like, that you use. Office, of course, we're Microsoft. <laughs> Thank you for shooting fish in a barrel. <laughs> Give me a hard one. Got it? Lee, what's you said? Get, got it? We own it. <laughs> 280 different services, and so far I've done this presentation in several places, and nobody has ever come up with an integration we don't have. I'm sorry? I'll have to look that up, but I think most of Google Suite is available. I've done integrations for Google Calendar, Google Apps, and Google's Power Platform, so yeah, possibly. We can look it up after the talk. Come up and see me. Otherwise, you may be a first, gentlemen. All right, so each of these connectors, as we're saying, have two different things. They have triggers and they have actions. So a trigger is something that we use to start a workflow. So this can be something like when an email arrives, when somebody says a specific thing on Slack, when a webhook is triggered, when somebody does a post request to your endpoint, anything like this is available. So that's a trigger, something that can start our workflow, an event. They also have actions, which is things we can do with this integration engine. So with this email thing, for example, we can create contacts, we can create meetings, we can delete emails, we can you know, do all sorts of things. So it's perfectly possible to set up uh, an automation for your email account. So every time you get an email from, let's say, your boss, I want that published to my boss Slack channel. So that you can only check your email, let's say in the morning, I like to do that. I check my emails, you know, I don't want to have notifications and, and things just bombarding me. I want to work when I'm working, right? But there are always exceptions to that rule. Like we have team managers, we have bosses, that sort of thing. So we could do a flow that just throws them into a channel that we have accepted that we can be disturbed by because after all, they pay our bills. Quite nice. Repetition is the mother of all learning. So, you know, let's repeat. A connector has what? It has triggers, right? And it has actions, very nice. So, if we take a look what's behind triggers and actions, it's REST APIs. So anything that has a REST API that is dec decorated with the Swagger data metadata forward or open API format and talks JSON can be presented as a logic app. We even have a um, open source uh, platform called the T-Rex Metadata Library that helps you build APIs to work well with logic apps. So if you give me a, a few more minutes, I can show you how you can actually use logic apps for your own products and add them into the workflow engine and how that could help you. But a lot of confusion when, when I have this talk tends to be Microsoft Flow and logic apps. Why? Well, they look the same. They do basically the same thing, but they're very different. They're not very different, but they're a bit different. So Logic Apps is a platform as a service. You go into the portal of Azure, you register for it. Well, it's a software as a service, but you kind of pay for it, having it hosted, that sort of thing. While Microsoft Flow is a pure kind of service, you go to a website, you go to flow.microsoft.com, you register, and there's your workflow engine. It's free. Most of the things I'm talking about today can be done using just Microsoft Flow. So if you feel, I don't want to have an Azure account, I, don't want to, I just want to try it out, I just want to test this, you can go to flow.microsoft.com and try most of these sort of stuff. To make it more complicated, Microsoft Flow has things that Logic App doesn't have, <laughs> which is the button trigger. And let's talk about our first productivity tip of the day. So Microsoft Flow comes with an app that allows us to do button triggers. They're nothing fancy, they're just an HTTP call, but they're very useful. So I have set up on my flow that as soon as somebody comments and disturb me at work, you know, when you're writing code, 
or when you're, if you're a product manager, I don't know what you guys do, updating an Excel spreadsheet. You seem to do that a lot. And somebody comes and disturbs you and wants to have you in a meeting. That happens, right? Come, come, come join my meeting, or do this estimate, or tell me I look nice. I don't know what you guys do in your meetings. But these sort of things takes time away from your work, and at the end of the week, if you're a consultant, like I was for 15 years at least, why haven't you billed the customer for all your work hours? This Well, you pulled me into that meeting. No, I don't remember that. What meeting? What was that meeting about? So with this flow, I'm going to demonstrate here. You take your phone, you push the button, you type in the text, what's the meeting about? One hour in your calendar. Perfect. Every time you have a meeting there and you can go back to it. And it's super simple to set up. It's a two-thing event. You do a manual trigger for a flow, which can only be done through flow, and then you do a create event. Does this sound useful? Nobody? I'm in a room with programmers where nobody ever gets disturbed at work. That's fantastic. All right. But this leads me into another thing, and we can go a bit more advanced. This leads me into something we like to talk about, dynamic content and expressions. So in this case, I am using U the UTC now function to get the date time. So let's talk a little bit about dynamic content and expressions. So all of these connectors that has triggers and actions, which again I said was just a REST API, all the properties of this REST API that they have in their JSON data, in their metadata, is being exposed as dynamic content. So every time you click on an input field, sorry, there we go. every time you click on an input field, this little menu pops up. That menu holds all the properties of your REST API. So this REST API now is filled with all the properties and blah, 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 that sort of thing that you can do. So in this case, we can, for example, we can use the body text of the message. We can use the subject of the message. We can use who it's from, and we can filter it, and we can do all sorts of magical stuff through a workflow menu. But to do that, we also, of course, we need some programming things. So in this case, we have the availability of most normal kind of software. Well, we have if cases, we have length, we have consists, we have uh, equals and and, and all that sort of thing. So we can go in and, so if we would like to write a little thing like, okay, if it's from my boss, change name to lovely person. If it's from my worst enemy at the office, change to horrible person or whatever, you know. And we can update anything from documents to, to all this sort of stuff. Um, this is kind of the only part where you tend to need a little bit of developer knowledge. You tend to need to understand a little bit about writing code, but you also tend to get a little bit frustrated if you know how to write code, because it comes with IntelliSense. So if you put a, a dot after it, it shows up all these lovely things that you have available to do. But actually, it's just for chaining. That is not how you actually use it. So we have, we, we're, it's not a perfect product. A lot of things in preview, and we're making it better. So if you're using it, feedback is always appreciated. So this is how you have to write it. So if you want to use a contains function, you don't do trigger body dot. Everything is changed. So you, the if consists of the contains. The contains consists of a trigger body. So everything is a function call. There are no lambda expressions and that sort of thing yet. There's also a very, very annoying bug I thought I mentioned if any one of you is going to try this, which is the double quotation mark versus the single quotation mark. So previous text has single quotation marks, which means it works fine. This example has double quotation marks, which means you will get this extremely detailed error message. Sorry about that. But now you know, so you don't have to do that mistake. Almost everything is single question marks. So this is the graphical editor. It's nothing special. There's a few buttons, pretty simple to use. You can also actually go into code view. So everything you see here is actually just detailed as JSON data. 
So everything in the background is just JSON. So if you remember that little code snippet we wrote, we can just as well go in here and actually write part of this code, or we can do work from here. And that's a good thing, because the editor isn't perfect, especially if you want to write long sentences of these sort of structures. It tends to be much easier to do it in the code editor than in the, the, um, the graphical editor, because there's a maximum length of your text, uh, text boxes, that sort of thing. Uh, error handling. We're getting to the good parts after this. So when we're, doing er when we're doing these sort of things, we're bound to get errors, right? Because people update APIs. Um, sometimes maybe we think there's going to be a value that is null. For example, oh, everybody has a location in their email, right? Well, no. And then we're going to fail. And then we need to be able to do graceful failings. So then we had the function configure run after. Configure run after pops up this nice little um, pop up that gives us the ability to set um, if it has failed, if it's timed out, and to do specific flows based on this. And kind of set up. I'm going to do a demo after we've gone through all the functions, and I can show you this more in detail. This tends to end that we do a terminate for action. This is just another connector, it's an action. We can do a terminate action, so we have status failed. Well, excellent. But then we can also include error codes, and we can include error messages, so we can actually have some sort of debugging features going on. We can also go into our history of all our runs. Every time your logic app triggers, it will, it will have a run history. So this run history, you can click in, you can, you can see how long time it took to run, at what time it ran, but you can also go into the detailed view of it by clicking it, and then we can see all the kind of like internal data, we can see all how it's composed and all the conditions or thing in the run. So really useful for, for debugging. So last thing before we get into some examples and some demos and what we can actually do with this technology quite useful. So control flows. So we have our standard condition, you know, if cases, if else, that sort of thing. We can do all the standard all the standard comparators so like contains and does not contain is equal to and all that sort of thing. If you actually select to use a dynamic content that is a collection, it would automatically include that in a for each loop for you. So we'll throw that in, and in this case, we're looping through all the attachments of an email, and we're dropping it into Dropbox. So if you want to upload all your images and that sort of thing, great, we'll pop it into, pop it into Dropbox. Um, we also have switch cases, and of course, while, and all that sort of stuff. So everything is here to do all this our regular programming solutions and that sort of thing. And then we have scope that is the ugly duckling list, because nobody seems to be using it, but it's a lovely feature. It allows you to put a lot of different things in it, and then just error handle the result of your entire scope. So it's a good way to put in for, uh, if you have a lot of things that might fail, but you want to have the same error message and that sort of thing. All right, so custom connectors I talked a little bit about. How many of you are API developers? Whoa, like 50% of you. That's good. So how many of you work for a startup? I'm in Lithuania, so I'm expecting this to be a lot of people. Two, three, OK. Um, one of the biggest problems that I had as a consultant tended to be if we build a product, and then customers came back and they wanted an integrational feature, right? It's super easy in this case to, to add a logic app thing to it we can just upload our Swagger file to the resource editor, give it a name, and boop. Then we can actually evaluate it through the Microsoft services. And you can have it added as an existing part of these 280-something connectors, if you'd like to. So this allows your customers to do their own integrations. 
So when customers come to you and they have this really weird request, you don't actually have to allocate resources, even if it means making money, you don't have to allocate resources to making this happen. So in this case, we can, we can make our customers happy without doing any work by simply offering this, this solution or this integration to a lot of gaps. But this is not a feature that is re restricted to Azure. You don't have to run Azure more than to host your logic apps. So if you have a, a SQL server or a MySQL or a Postgres SQL or a BizTalk server or a, even a file system, all of these are able to run the on-premise data gateway, which is a link in the presentation, and you can connect all your internal servers and have those interact with Logic Apps as well. So, what this gives us, okay, you have to do an Azure resource for your on-premise data gateway, but this is just, you know, plumbing. So you set this up, you hook the other one up, up and as soon as you've done that, then as soon as you create any one of the uh, connectors that I listed, you will have this option called Connect via On-Premise Data Gateway. And it will automatically list all your available SQL servers, Postgres, MySQL, or whatever you choose to use. So even if you have a local on-prem server, it gives you the ability to react to changes to the file system, changes to all the things that you have there. All right, so let's go into some examples, make this interesting. I travel a lot for work. How many of you travel for work? Lots of you, great. Do you have a spouse at their home, you know, a wife? I do. And one of the first things that we started doing when I started traveling for work was arguing you never told me you were going there. We have a dinner date with those, right? Anybody recognize this? So we set up a communal calendar. We set up a calendar where everything's supposed to be. Like, if, are you away or are you home? Are we having dinner with the Svensons? Or, you know, we're Swedish. Everybody's a Svensson. Uh, are, what are we doing? Are we traveling? Are we going? What are we doing? Everything should be here so we can, you know, plan our lives accordingly. So I decided to, every time I have a meeting more than 150 kilometers away, well, I'm not gonna go, you know, there and back. So I wanna have a flow that solves this for me. So I never wanna have the discussion, you didn't t tell, tell me. No, I told you, it's in the communal calendar. This sounds like a pretty easy flow to set up. My first attempt I ended up with this monstrosity. There is, um, you probably can't see that, the resolution isn't good enough. Let me just walk you through it. There is SQL server requests, there is, and the, but the specific thing, to get into, if I'm to 150 kilometers or more away, I had to use some sort of service and there's lots of available ones, like Google Maps and Bing Maps, and being a Microsoft employee, of course, I choose Bing Maps. And it works pretty well, except for the fact that it translates Skype meeting to Xinxuanshu in China. Which meant that every time I had a Skype meeting, it marked my communal calendar that I was going to China. It also taught me one of the biggest, earliest mistakes that I did, which was that I didn't properly name my connectors. And in this case, you can see this one is called connection one, this one is called connection six, and what I didn't know at the time when I started working this, but I started playing with this for over a year ago, was that I had absolutely no idea that these names are about all the other connectors, because it's just JSON, right? So all the strings, in this case, is what all the other features identify. So if you have something down here that depends on something you added earlier in the workflow, you can't change this name, because then this one breaks. And if you haven't named them properly, that refactoring is hell. 
So let me show you the workflow that I actually, so this is kind of a pattern that I figured out. First of all, name the stuff as you create them and name them what they do. If you have an if case that looks if something is equals to, well, name it to that. This checks if location is Skype meeting. In that case, do not do anything, that kind of thing. All right, so let's break it down to something that's easier to see. In this case, we have, um, we have a Office 365 event. Somebody added me to a meeting. We use Bing Maps to see if the location is more than 150 kilometers away from home, and then we create an event. But as you saw, this becomes really, really complex really, really quickly. So the pattern that I came up with was to do a event and then a routing. So in this case, one of the biggest problems I had with starting this up was that for every calendar event, it can be a new event, it can be an updated event, and it can be a canceled event, right? So th it's the same trigger. And then you have to use the, a switch case or something like that and break it out. So I did a router. Just, it takes the event in. If it's a new event, route it to the specific flow for that. This gave me the ability to break it up. So now I only had to look if it's 150, like if it's a new event, if it's routed to the new event one, I only have to look if it's more than 150 kilometers and then create the event. But since I'm now doing routing with a webhook, I can really, really easily add additional flows to the first router. So anytime somebody adds me to an event, let's say I get accepted to build stuff, to speak there. Cool, awesome, great. But that means I want to update my community calendar. I might want to start a blog draft about it. I might want to send an email to my travel agency. All sorts of things that comes into this workflow. And this just breaks it down and becomes much, much, much simpler. In this case, we have the router, we have create the event. When an event is added, update or deleted, you know, terminate. But if it's new and added, just create the event JSON and do the HTTP request. Um, this has since been changed and I'm still working on updating this because we now have a way for logic apps to trigger other logic apps. So now I don't need to use HTTP. But this has been working flawlessly for me for over a year. So I'm not really looking to mess with it. <laughs> it's quite nice. Um, all right. So next useful flow. I tend to forget to remove my Azure resources when I'm creating, when I'm playing around with Azure. That costs money. A colleague of mine, he forgot to turn off Azure media services running on the highest setting. That is $50,000 a month. That is not something you want to forget. I mean, we have all sorts of these flows, right? Where we, where we want to be able to remember them. So this is a super simple flow. It just looks at all the Azure resource groups. If there's someone named, for example, let's say, build stuff, demo, 2018, 10, 16. Then on the 17th, it will delete that resource group. Because that event is over, you don't have to keep it. It's really useful, it works really well for me. And I'd like to just go through it because it's, so first of all, we're using the list resource group connector, which just gives us the, uh, all the resource groups. We use a for each loop that looks at the variable, and then substrings, if, it's, if it value, the value contains demo, it substrings the, the, um, the date, and see this is an old slide because that's not today's date, but anyway. Uh, and if the date is equal to the delete date, it runs delete resource group. It's pretty simple, right? So uh, let's actually do a demo. How many of you for, ever forgot to respond to an email? You're awake! <laughs> All hands in the air! Cool. Okay, so this is actually what we're, we're working with. Um, so, if you go to that and actually create your own logic app, 
there's all sorts of available pre-made recipes. Like when a new tweet is posted, I want to do something, when an event grid error occurs, when a file is added to my FTP server, all these sort of boring things that we don't want to code. It's just here and available. But okay, let's do a, a blank logic app. Uh, the first thing it's going to show us is a group of, we can go to all. Let's see if there's actually Google Chat. There's not Google Chat. Damn it. All right. So we wanted to, when we, when we flagged a new email, I'm going to use Office 365 because that's, well, what I have. So when an email is flagged, Every three minutes, that sounds a bit often. Let's do every 15 minutes. So when an email is flagged, we can do all, all sorts of stuff with this here. Can you see, by the way? Yeah, seems pretty good. Then I want to add a to-do to my solution, okay? So first of all, we need to add a subject. Out pops out the available dynamic content talked about. And here we can go in and actually search the dynamic content. I want to have the subject. Very nice. And the due date. Well, as you can see here, it's also suggesting to me good properties to use for this sort of flow. Okay, this is a date time, so it's just a date time. Um, but since this is an expression, I don't want to have a, um, I don't want it to complete it at the same time. So let's do add days. Changed to English by some reason. And I'm a Swedish person, so there we go. So even if you're writing expressions, right, you can go in here and you can actually use um, use all of the uh, available data. In this case, we're going to have to add days, and we're going to say, okay, I want to have two days for my, because I'm a lazy bugger, I don't want to respond to email too quickly. Done. So now we're going to get a due date, two days, and we can do a reminder date if we want to do that. So we can just go in here, copy the existing one of the expression. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we can say we want to have a reminder. One day, perhaps, done. We can set importance and all these sort of things. Done. So that's how long time we need to build an integration that takes an email and then adds it to a to-do list. If you also wanted to save every additional email to a SQL server, we go here. We would select insert row function and select our connection. So there's a lot of power that you can do things here. There's also a lot of evil you can do with this because it is perfectly possible to hook up your product manager's Excel spreadsheet to your production SQL server. But let's show you some control flows as well. So if Let's say that for some reason we're not able to reach to do. And we have the ability to do, all right. If we for some reason has another thing then. Uh, like I, I don't know if I told you, but you cannot fail the absolute first thing of your flow. Here we go. So if this one has failed, No, all right. Then I want to run this, but I also want to run this. And this can be a bit confusing. Can you, can you read that, by the way? Should I zoom in more? There. In this case, terminate will run off the compose. The, the, the failure handler is successful. So if you want to continue running your flow after that compose, then you have to select if it's, if it's skipped. 
So if everything works fine, it doesn't run it off to failure, so it's skipped, then run this. This, this uh, will now continue as normal and go into terminate flow. So if you're starting to do things inside your team, making custom connectors, that sort of thing, and maybe you do not want to share that data. You have built, built things, you have things that works for your um, DevOps flow, or DevOps connected, that sort of thing, and you don't want to share that. You can actually export all of these things as templates. You just go into your feature and export it. This gives you the ability to get a JSON file that you can version handle, that you can... Oh, sorry. And export that trigger. That's fine. But that means you can version handle them. And so on. But if you don't want to export them, but you just want to have them on your local computer, it's also possible to do exactly the same thing as I've shown you now in Visual Studio. Cool. So if you want to copy any one of the flows that I've shown you here today. I have made a GitHub repo where all of them are at. So you can just go there and you can just get them down and you can import them and run all of these flows that I talked about if you want to experiment with them. Uh, they also work through uh, Microsoft Flow if you want to use it without paying for Azure subscription if you don't have one. Uh, last time I did this talk, it was at a project manager conference. And I got a tweet, a direct message, a couple of months afterwards by a developer who works for one of the product managers over there. This is a really good story of how powerful this can be when you actually figure out what you use it for. So one of the product managers over there, he had gone to his developer team and he said, I'm going to automate, so I'm going to send an email. I'm going to send an email our customers, every day, that shows our progress. Every day. And the developers went like, no, 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 you can't do that. We have huge, huge, huge work sets. You know, it's going to look like we do nothing. And, and the product manager went, no, 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 don't worry about it. It's going to be fine. The developers, you know, doom, gloom, and everything is bad. So but he set it up. So every day, it exported all their work items, all their completed work items, and it sent the, pro the customer an email showing the progress. Were there any progress? Of course not, because we don't tend to write small work items. That is something developers struggle with all the time, making customers write small work items. So this developer, he wrote to me that he complained, and he started saying, you've you got to remove this, you've got to remove this, and the product manager said, no, no, don't trust, trust me. It will be fine. And it continued, and the customers started getting angry. Like, Why is nothing happening? And the product manager said to him, well, I'll tell you what, come and have a meeting with my developers, and we'll talk about it. So the customer came to their office, and he was like, yeah, why is nothing happening? And the developer said, well, you know, there, there's very big work items. Like, many of these takes weeks to build, eight, nine days. That's why you don't see anything happening. The customer went, oh, that's interesting. So if I, if I write smaller work items, if I have smaller things, if I, if I break them down, I will see more progress. Yeah, sure. And that is the most Machiavellian thing I've ever heard in my life. Because this product manager, he made this customer do all their work. He was meticulous after this, breaking down work items into super small pieces. Super easy for the developers. And the thing was that this was a kind of like a thing that continued to be giving. Because then he asked, okay, why was there no progress in this one? It was a small work item. Well, they were missing information. Oh, good. So then we need to be clear with what information we put into this. It's a super simple way to add feedback to a customer. Because we all know, when you're giving something, if you're getting something for free, then you're going to use it. Right?
There's supposed to be questions there, I think. Are there no questions? Are people using that system? All right, I have one final tip before you, and then we're gonna do some questions and that sort of thing. We have nine minutes to go, so plenty of time. I was quick, and you weren't that questionized. Um, how many of you use Microsoft Forms? Google Forms? Microsoft Forms there, Google Forms there. Don't fight, it's love for everyone. So we have a customer who set up an entire web shop through Microsoft Forms and Logic Apps. It is the most insane thing I've ever seen, and I do not in any way recommend to do this. Absolutely not. But, he had no money. There's two free services. He sold gaming stuff, so it wasn't like a huge number of things. He did this for about a year. Now he's running Shopify, because now he can pay for that license. Still not making a lot of money, but he's making a business. And I think it's kind of sweet. All right, guys and girls. Thanks a lot for listening to me jabber. I really do hope you will try out Logic Apps. Uh, I will, uh, the build stuff will have my slides if you want to check them out. There's a lot of uh, documentation and that kind of things at the end here that you can look at if you want to go through it. Uh, we have uh, eight minutes to go, so if there's any questions, I'm happy to take one. Oh. Are Flow services available in Enterprise Azure? Very good question. Yes, they are available in Enterprise. But also, we have available enterprise connectors. What nerd asked that, by the way? So I'm assuming this means if you're available in enterprise agreement, Asher? Who asked the question? Hello. Okay, so <laughs> they left. <laughs> Did they leave? <laughs> um, so how much is it? How long is the string? You pay for each uh, execution, you pay for each connector that you use. So if you have 100 connectors, you pay more than if you have a flow with one connectors. You pay per execution and you pay per flow. It's really cheap. It's a serverless feature, it costs virtually nothing. It's super cheap to use. Uh, I have about 10 running and I think it cost me like $3 a month or something. In total. Ooh, that's a good question. Yes, you actually can. So if you, have the, uh, uh, if you have the event source, so you're getting all the events from Data Factory, uh, then you can do amazing things with that. Because all the events, they, sp they shoot out so many events that you can actually take and you can run flows on top of it. And so all of those kind of like miniature tasks, cleaning tasks, data cleaning tasks that you want to do with Data Factory is available through this, which can be really beautiful. Another thing that you can do if you like SQL Server, so um, if, if somebody of you doesn't run cryptation, and we're in Europe with GDPR, that's a dumb thing not to do. Uh, so we tend to use cryptation, right? Uh, but to debug sometimes, we need to d disable cryptation. And what people tend to do then, is set up a flow through event source, uh, that when somebody disables cryptation of the SQL Server, it sends an email to the entire development team, so everybody knows that cryptation has been disabled. This can be done for most features, like all the sort of settings and things that you want to have activated or not activated can be triggered upon. Oh, nerd. <laughs> now I was reading the name, nerd. I'm not sure, honestly, uh, I'm not sure. Please come up afterwards and we'll, we can elaborate on that a little bit. All right, that's it for me. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>